I mean, the risk is if he tells the Taliban the truth, that the Americans built the road and he, he would like to cooperate with the Americans. He doesn't want to go there. He's going to, he's going to you know, the Taliban will attack him. Low frequency high impact, if he told the Americans directly that he was actually cooperating with the Taliban, it's also going to be really bad. And he can't do that. So he doesn't do it. He tries to tell them indirectly through a parable saying, look, the Taliban are here like the ants are here. We can't do anything about them. We have to live with them. They're here now. They'll be here in 10 years. You'll be gone next year, we hope. So we have to cooperate with them. But I can't tell you this directly, so I'm telling you about ants and wheats. That's why he does it. If he told them directly, he'd be accused of being a traitor or they would blow up his face. So he tries to do it indirectly. It's quite logical. His communicative strategy is very, very rational. It's also quite rational for him to cooperate more with the Taliban than with the Americans. Because one is of higher frequency than the other, and for longer term. He's got other problems. He's got to maintain the trust of the other villagers. And he's got a low frequency, low impact problem of this interpreter whom he doesn't know. But it's a one-off, it's low frequency, and he has no strategy for dealing with it, and he thinks it's unimportant. Now there's one other participant in this communicative act, and that is the interpreter. I hate these people, sir. When I ask him something else, they answer me, it's the wrong, they give me wrong answer. I fucking hate this town. <laughs> Why does the interpreter say that? I hate these people, sir. When I ask them something, they give the wrong answer. Is he just stupid? I don't think so. I think he, too, is being quite rational in terms of risk. For the interpreter, his high-frequency, high-impact concern is to maintain the trust of the U.S. These are the people who are paying him. And they're going to be paying him a lot more than he's going to earn doing anything else for us. So that's his main concern. He wants that sergeant to believe that he's on the side of the sergeants. That's the most important thing. That's why he says, I hate these people, so. He can see the sergeant is frustrated. The sergeant wanted some information. He didn't get the information. He's frustrated. The interpreter says, be frustrated with those guys, but not with me. I tried. They give the wrong answer. I tried. I'm your other side. Very logical thing. What's his other problem? Low frequency, high, high impact. He could be seen as a traitor to the Afghan people. Okay, that would be high impact. But he sees it as being a low frequency thing. <coughs> he's going to stay with the Americans. We assume. Otherwise, he's not acting rationally. He's got another problem. He has to maintain the trust of other tribes. He doesn't speak the same variety. We know that when they begin uh, speaking. He has to establish some kind of capacity to act as an intermediary. That's high frequency, but of low impact. They don't seem to be interested in his function, so he's not too worried about establishing trust. He can live with that. And he can live with not telling, not relaying what they're saying. There's another problem, it's low frequency and low impact. What if there is a television camera present and he will be filmed and his words will be translated into English and be seen by us? This could be a problem if he wants to get a job at this institute. <laughs> but where he is, and for his concerns and for his risk management, that is irrelevant. Wherever that television camera is going, He's not there. So he's quite rational in not paying much attention to that. And doing everything he can to handle his main problem, which is maintaining the trust of the sergeant. It seems to me that in this communicative event, everybody is managing their risks quite rationally. And in terms of risk management theory, people are assumed to be rational egoists. They will advance their own interests 
in a rational way. They will be able to calculate that risk is higher than that risk. That frequency is lower than that risk. And we do this all the time. When we enter into a transaction, when we get a degree, when we fall in love, when we have friends. All these things have been analyzed in terms of cooperation theory, risk management theory of the kind we have here. Is there cooperation? Is there something ethical? That's the problem for me. The only cooperation is between the interpreter and the sergeant. They cooperate very well. There is no cooperation with the other communicative or communication participants. That's what makes it unethical for me. You've made it not beneficial for those other people to the extent one party has to run away and the other party has to speak in a parable that nobody can understand. So I can describe the event, I can describe the risk management, I can say everybody's being rational, and I can say it's not ethical. It's ethical in part, but not as an entire event. That's it. I've applied my theory to cross-cultural communication. Could it be more ethical? Well, very hard. Extremely hard. You know, there are situations where communication is not going to work. No, man, no amount of communication could work. And uh, this is why I would think that the best cooperation could be achieved here by absolute silence on the part of the United States. Application of theory. Now move to some of the research that we're doing, uh, which is the way translators act here. Um, it seems to me that if you're clever and you think about communication in these terms, you can get speech coming in for the interpreter or a text on your desk for your translators and quite quickly see which bits are important for your client, which bits are high risk in those terms. And you should see what's high risk or low risk for you. Uh, so basically you're thinking about your client and yourself, occasionally the client, yourself, and the end user. Okay. Now there are three things that you can do with risk. Here they are. You can be risk aversive. If, if there's any risk, you run away from it, like the villagers, you know, hide. That's risk aversion. Sometimes it's the best thing to do. Uh, translators apply risk aversion quite often. Most obviously in omission. If you're not sure of something, or interpreters do it all the time. If you're not sure of something and it looks like it's high risk and, and uh, omit. <laughs> Leave it out. It's like surgeons. When they're taught, I'm told, if in doubt, cut it out. Okay. Translators and interpreters tend to do the same thing, rather than be wrong. That's for low frequency. If it's high frequency, you have to do something else. And the usual thing you find people doing for risk uh, aversion here, the second one, is uh, generalizing. You take it to a less specific level. Okay? Instead of saying uh, a Mac Air computer, uh, and you don't know what that is, you're not sure what it is, you're saying, I compute. And you won't be wrong. Okay? So, the rule we learn intuitively is, if in doubt, leave it out, or generalize. You move up one level of lack of precision. And that's, that's a normal strategy. Uh, many of the things translators do are risk, or indi uh, indicate risk aversion. Translators, I don't know about interpreters, but I haven't done a lot of research on that, but you'll see in a minute. I suspect that translators and interpreters, I suspect, are not people who would bet a lot of money on a horse race. Or you would probably not want to invest, if you were investing in the stock market, you would invest in solid, safe stocks. Shares in companies that make a a bit of profit over a long time in an ideal economy. 
you would not invest in a high-risk startup company, for example. Translators tend not to be that sort of person. Translators, translators when I look at actual translations, uh, seem to be quite risk averse. Other things they do, though, is um, transfer risk. Risk transfer can be done in several ways. Uh, the most frequent one is if you've got something in the source text and you don't really understand it, you put exactly the same thing in the target text. And you're not wrong. You're not right, but you're not wrong. What you've done, you transferred the risk back to the source. You say, well, the author said it, not me. Al Kobe. Al Kobe. You know what Al Kobe are? Aristotle wrote a book on animals, and he knew that the earth was round. Do you know how he knew the earth was round? Well, he knew from, from measuring shadows, but anyway. Uh, he knew that there were Al Kobe at one end of the earth and the other. And when Aristotle's book on animals came through Syriac into Arabic, into Latin, in uh, 12th century Hispania, the translators into Latin said, well, what are these animals, these al -Kobi? And nobody knew. But they knew they were at the ends of the earth. Well, we could travel to the ends of the earth to find out, but that's too much effort. There's not going to be much you know, benefit, not much cooperation, too much effort. So risk transfer, they wrote al -Kobi. From the Arabic. They used the Arabic term in, in, in Latin, and Latin had these animals called al Kobi for quite a while. Until they got the Greek manuscript of Aristotle in the next century, and people discovered that al Kobi in the Greek were elephantus. <laughs> and suddenly they knew. That elephant was, there were elephants at the ends of, in, in, in India and in Africa, therefore the earth was round. All right. uh, the translators were quite logical in, in, in not knowing what to do, therefore using risk aversion, uh, risk transfer. Hmm. I don't know, but they said it, it's their problem. Or you phone the client and say, What should I do? Whatever the client says, right, you, you do it. And if the client gives you instructions, you do it. Why? Because you transfer the risk to the client. You know it's wrong, you do it. Doesn't matter. That's their risk. <coughs> You've got nothing. Yeah? Risk seeking. Some people, extreme sports, some people are risk seekers. Some people have to drive cars very fast. Some people have to surf super huge waves. Some people, I don't know, translators don't do those things. Uh, Okay, but some people want to go and you know, be journalists in, in a war zone. And they are risk seeking, usually because there are big rewards. Now, the rewards may be monetary, or uh, they may be rewards that are psychological or symbolic, or adrenaline, if it makes you feel that good. That's, that's a reward as well. Okay. Uh, there are risk seeking people and risk seeking attitudes. We've been looking at a series of translators working. I think I showed you uh, the Think Aloud Protocols. It was a translator translating and speaking. And we looked at a whole class of 15 people and analyzed them in depth, performing one translation. And we were able now to characterize the nature of the risk strategies that are used by these people. Here's one, for example. We look at um, risk seeking, risk aversion, and risk transfer. You can see this person, they all use more risk aversion than actually risk seeking. And the first column is the strategy or the solution they originally proposed. The second one is what they adopt. And you can see very quickly here they're actually quite stable. Some people change their attitude throughout the translation performance. But we can characterize uh, you, translators, and you, interpreters, in terms of how you act when distributing risk uh, or, or acting in terms of risk um, in your translation performance.
What bothers me a little, and why I say translators tend to be risk averse, I say it because, do you, do you remember the um, universals I mentioned when we talked about descriptive translation studies? I said people have studied corpora of translations against corpora of non-translations. We find some things us, you know, are more or less generally uh, different. That translations tend to be more generalized, there's more explicitation, there's more uh, literalism, there's interference, and there, is, uh, there are examples of non-translation. These are risk-averse strategies. And these are the things that are being proposed as universals. I couldn't see in any of the list of universals, in any of the proposed universals, anything that would be risk-taking. Hence my concern that translators don't like risk. Why should translators not like risk? Why should you want to protect yourself more than anybody else, like the interpreter in Afghanistan? Several reasons. Firstly, in many cases you can't see what would be successful. You don't, you're not told enough about the participants and what they want to achieve. You, you come in blind to a conference, or you, you get a, a bit of paper and you don't know where it's going from or who it's going to. So you can't judge success, going, so you can't distribute your risk rationally. You're not paid to do it, and some people are paid. An example from the film Patton. Patton was the American general in charge of the 7th Army that marched into Berlin at the end of the Second World War. And there's this wonderful scene in the film where you have the general, the American general here with the Americans, and the Russian general there with the Russian, the Soviet general with the Soviets. Okay, because both armies come into Berlin, which is why Berlin was divided for a long time. And they're having a party because they've won. There are Cossack dancers and everything and drinking it. And, uh, and the Russian general proposes a toast. And General Patton, the American general, says to his interpreter, tell him he's a son of a bitch. <laughs> I cite the film. Uh, <laughs> and the interpreter correctly says, I can't tell him that, sir. Tell him he's a son of a bitch. I can't, sir. It'll be World War Three. <laughs> Tell him he's a son of a bitch. <laughs> Goes, gets the Russian, comes back. Sir, he says, you're a son of a bitch too. <laughs> and then the two generals toast. They understand each other perfectly. The Cold World War begins right there. And the interpreter did his job. Okay? That is, the generals are paid to take high-risk decisions. The interpreter is not paid to do that. He is quite correct in alerting his client to the possible risk, high-risk, very high-risk implications <laughs> involved, but at the end of the day, the intermediaries are not the people who are there who are being rewarded to take the high risks. Generals are, or the sergeant is in the film we saw, or your clients are. Uh, in, in most of your cases. Okay. The reason for this can be taken right back. This is Leonardo Bruni, who was Chancellor of the Republic of Florence, and he was the first great Renaissance man. Uh, many things, as Renaissance men did, he was also a translator. And in one of his early translations, he laments the fact that authors always get the praise for what is good in a translation, and translators just get the blame for what is wrong. And I suspect that this is the kind of reward structure that we're dealing with. Even if translators did take a risk, and there were great rewards, the rewards would not go to the translator, they would go to the author, or to your client. That is, translators don't take risks, we tend to be risk averse, because nobody is paying us. 
to do that. 